Some people consider that last song we sang, and particularly one line of it, one, maybe one of the greatest lines in all of uh, Christian song, the line where, you know, if the, if the sky was a, was a scroll and the oceans were filled with ink and all of us were scribes, there wouldn't be enough to write all about the love of God. I mean, when you think about that, that's, a, that's an amazing, amazing thought. And, and the psalm that we're going to look at today, Psalm 23, is one of the best-known psalms ever, written by David, who was a shepherd before he became famous. And, and it is a psalm that has a universal appeal. We don't know exactly when David wrote it, and I think that helps with the appeal. We don't know the circumstances, so it kind of applies to everybody. Um, so I think Spurgeon called it the pearl of the psalms, yeah, but I've also heard it called the most dangerous psalm. And it's dangerous because everybody already thinks they know it. And everybody's heard this psalm, everybody uh, thinks that they're familiar with it, and so it kind of gets taken for granted, and we don't ever slow down and think carefully about what it really says. So I'm hoping that we can do that. Uh, this week and next. So let me just read the psalm for us. It's a psalm of David, and it says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. These are great words, and uh, we just want to break it down into two parts for our two studies, and I think the theme of those first three verses is the the shepherd's sufficiency. And you can see that on your handout. Uh, we need to learn to trust in the shepherd's sufficiency because it says, if he's your shepherd, you shall not want. Now, that speaks of sufficiency. Uh, what it's saying is the shepherd is sufficient for all that we need. And, and notice that David confidently affirms that statement. I mean, that truth. Uh, he, he just confidently says it. And that's an interesting thing about this uh, psalm is there's no requests anywhere in here. There's just three strong statements of affirmation. This is the first one, I shall not want. Verse four, I will fear no evil. And verse six, I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Uh, these are just really bold, strong, confident, affirmations that David makes, and it's all based on the fact that the Lord is his shepherd. So every one of us here would probably affirm that truth as well, right? Unless you're sensing that I'm setting you up for a trap here. Uh, yeah, if the, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not, I shall not want. Uh, do we, do we always act like he's enough? No, no we don't. And, and in fact, let's think about this. This is the Bible class. This is an interactive, alive group, even, with, even though it's Memorial Day weekend, and we're thinking about what we're going to be grilling later. Uh, here's, here's the interactive part. How do we act like he's not enough? What are, what are the ways that we would show in just our behavior? We would never say this. We would never say it out loud. Oh, yeah, Jesus, he's not enough. But in what ways do we act like he's not enough? How would that be seen? Thinking you can do it yourself. Can do it yourself. What's that? Control. control. You want to be in control? Complaining. Complaining? Nobody does that. <laughs> Looking to other people for your satisfaction. Stuff. Stuff. We trust in our stuff. Yeah. Fear would be another way, too. That was mentioned, I think, back in the uh, 
bleachers back there. Um, there's lots of ways that we act like he's not enough. So we do need to think carefully about what this is, is really saying and whether we can really say it ourselves or not. When he says, I shall not want, what he's saying there is, I have a totally satisfied heart. My heart is completely satisfied in the shepherd. And so let's, let's just break it down. He, he identifies the Lord as his shepherd. And the, and the word here that we have translated Lord is the Hebrew word Yahweh, which, which is an important thing uh, because the Lord sounds like a title. Yahweh is his name. Remember in Exodus 3 when uh, Moses has that encounter at the burning bush and God says, I'm going to send you back to your people and you're going to lead them out of Egypt. And Moses says, well, who should I tell them has sent me? What's your name? And God said, I am that I am. Uh, Yahweh. And, uh, and that is his name. And, and, and so that adds a personal, intimate element to this fact when i say the lord is my shepherd uh, that that's not the, the title it's it's his name i'm calling him by his name uh, that indicates a closeness there and um when he when god says i am that i am that's an expression of the fact that he is totally self-sufficient totally self-sufficient so he doesn't need anything. He doesn't need anybody. And so we find our sufficiency in the one who is totally, the only one who is totally self-sufficient. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Yes. Because who, who was speaking to Moses from that burning bush? It was the angel of the Lord and if you trace that through, you could identify that as what we call pre-incarnate appearances of Christ, second person of the Trinity uh, that it is. And um, Isaiah sees Yahweh sitting on his throne, and in John 12, we're told that, that he saw Jesus sitting on that throne. That's just, that was just all for free. You can follow up on that on your own, do your own research, write papers, send me emails, correct me. But I'm probably not going to change my view. But anyways, uh, the, it's the Lord. The Lord is my, is my shepherd, and the Lord is my shepherd. That's significant there, too. It's not like he was my shepherd, he's going to be my shepherd. No, he is he always is. He is my shepherd at all times. He is my shepherd in every single circumstance. It's not like he shows up, you know, Monday through Friday, nine to five, and then he takes the weekends off. Shepherds don't do that. Shepherds can't do that because the sheep are totally dependent on the shepherd. The shepherd's got to be there. And so he is my shepherd. Uh, and, and he is my shepherd, meaning nobody else is my shepherd. He's my shepherd. Uh, a lot of times we want to add somebody else into the equation, but no, he is my shepherd. And of course, we know that that was a common way that Jesus, Jesus was referred to, right? As a shepherd. Let's, let me give you a few of those references. In John chapter 10, Jesus often is referred to as a shepherd, and, and the way you would understand a shepherd it helps us understand Jesus and his ministry to his people. In John 10, verse 11, he says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He was a hired hand and not a shepherd who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming, and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he's a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. He's the good shepherd who gives his life for the sheep. There's, a, there's an amazing... Uh, 
statement there in verse 14 that's worthy of your meditation sometime. He says, I know my own and my own know me. Here we go. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. Uh, you talk about an intimate relationship. He's saying, my relationship with my sheep is just like my relationship with the Father. It's that intimate, that personal, that close. So here he's called the Good Shepherd. In Hebrews 13, 20, he's called the Great Shepherd. And then there's a couple of places in uh, 1 Peter where he's called, he's spoken of as a shepherd. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 25 uh, says, For you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. He's the shepherd of your soul. And in chapter 5, verse 4, at the end of a section that's referring to pastors or shepherds in the church, he refers to Jesus in verse 4 as the chief shepherd. So who's the, who's the pastor of Compass Bible Church, Huntington Beach? Jesus is. Jesus is the shepherd. He's the pastor. We got guys who have titles pastor, but they work for the chief shepherd. And they do his business on his terms. They're there to represent him and to do his work. It's not their church. It's not the pastor's church. You understand that? Are you glad about that? Yes. Yeah. You know what? It's not your church either. And one of the biggest sources of conflict in the church is when you've got a bunch of sheep and they all want things their way. That causes friction in the flock. Because I want every minister to cater to me and my needs. And if it doesn't, I'm not here to be built up and to build others up. It's all about me getting what I want. That is one of the biggest most common sources of friction in the flock. When people just, I just want it my way. I mean, are, are we, should we sing that hymn on uh, something? I did it my way. <laughs> and, and that's the key, is that we are the sheep in this story. We, we are sheep, which is not a complimentary <laughs> way of talking about people. Uh, there are three things that are characteristic of sheep. They are stupid. <laughs> they, they don't know what they're doing or where they're going or why they're going there. And if they wander off somewhere, uh, they, uh, they will never find their way back. They're not like your dog. Nobody's making movies about about the incredible journey of the sheep who found his way home. <laughs> not, it's, not, it's, not, it's not happening. Don't expect that in a theater anytime soon. Uh, sheep do not do that. They are stupid. And they are dirty. I mean, they're out walking trails during the day, and they've got wool, and it just, all that dirt goes up in their wool. They are... They are stupid, they are dirty, and they are defenseless. They can't defend themselves against anything. Uh, they, they got no way to defend themselves, so that they're like that, that's the good picture of us. We are totally helpless. And Jesus said, You can't do anything apart from me. And that, that's the reality. And so we, you need a shepherd who can lead and guide and provide and protect and strengthen the, the sheep. And, and that's what Jesus does. You know, I, I think a lot of times today, uh, we, we, want, we are not only talk about how we act like Jesus isn't enough, we, want, we really want Jesus plus something else 
Uh, I'm trusting in Jesus plus some experience I've had. I'm trusting in Jesus plus my good works. I'm trusting in Jesus plus uh, all the ministry I've done. We're not trusting in Jesus alone. But, you know, there's a cause and effect statement there in the, in the psalm. The cause is, the Lord is my shepherd. The effect is, I shall not want. I shall never want would be another way you could translate that. Because he is everything I need. In him I find everything I need. I will never want. And Jesus would make those kind of statements. Remember in John chapter 4 when he's talking to the woman at the well? And he says in John 4, 13, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up into eternal life. You'll never want if you drink the water I give you. And then in John chapter 6, uh, after he feeds the, the multitude, he, he says in verse 35, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. N never. This is, a, this is an incredible statement uh, of the sufficiency of our, of our shepherd. And you know, there are, there are benefits to living near a beach. Maybe not the benefits you're thinking, but there are, there are benefits to living near a, a, a beach. Re remember uh, uh, Psalm 139, his thoughts of ours, uh, towards us are more than the grains of sand. H how many grains of sand are there? Just go down to the beach and start counting. But also one of my favorite verses is John chapter 1, verse 16, talking about the sufficiency of Christ and all that we have in him. Uh, he says, it says, for from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. And the picture there is just grace after grace after grace. So every time I go down to the beach and I see the waves coming in, I think it's grace after grace after grace. It's, it's what he does. You're, you're never going to want, he, because he never stops giving you grace. And in Colossians chapter 2 and verse 9, 9 and 10, it says, For in him, meaning in Christ, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. So that's a great statement of the deity of Christ and the fullness of deity in him. And then verse 10 says, and you have been filled in him. I mean, that's an incredible statement. And this is another place where a beach analogy helps. If you go down and stand on the edge of the Pacific Ocean and you look out, you can't see the end of it. So as far as you're concerned, it's like infinite. But you can be filled with that ocean. You just take a little jar with you and fill it up with ocean water, and you've got a jar that's filled with the ocean. And that's the way it is. Christ is infinitely full. His grace is infinite. But I can be filled, my little jar can be filled with that. I mean, this is an incredible statement that we just, you know, breeze right by too often without really thinking about what is it, what's it saying. There was a little girl in a Sunday school class one day who was asked to recite the first verse of Psalm 23, and she said, the Lord is my shepherd, that's all I want. Uh, she didn't say it right, but she got it right. Is that what you're saying? The Lord is my shepherd, that's all I want? Or are you saying, 
the Lord is my shepherd, but there's a few other things I, I want too. And those few other things could be a whole list of things. They could be good things. But uh, the, the, the statement is, uh, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And, and, you know, the thing is, you can't say, I shall not want, unless you can say, the Lord is my shepherd. And, and if the Lord is my shepherd, I, 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 I'm, I can't help but have a satisfied heart in him. Now, here's something interesting to think about. Who's David saying this to? Uh, no, he, he's, no, well, of course, Yahweh is hearing him. He's saying this to himself. The Lord is my shepherd. That, that's what we need to do. We, we need to talk to ourselves. We too often listen to ourselves and say, I need this, I need that, I, wa I want that. We need to talk to ourselves and say, no, the Lord is my shepherd. I need to uh, assure my heart that the Lord, he, he's my shepherd. Does that make sense? Is that helpful? So it's all about, it's one little verse packed with this truth of the sufficiency of the shepherd. And we could have spent a whole, a whole lesson on that. But we're not going to because we're on a time frame here. But the thing is, we're, we're, it's not like we're moving away from that because verses 2 and 3, uh, they really show you how he is sufficient for you. This is how his sufficiency is seen in what we're told in verses 2 and, and 3. And so verse 2 uh, talks about the satisfaction that you find in the shepherd, and we can rest in the shepherd's satisfaction. It says, he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. And that verse isn't talking so much about eating the grass or drinking the water. This is a picture of peace. This is a sheep that is totally at peace. I mean, he's... he's put a hammock up between two trees, and he's kicking back and relaxing. This is a picture of a sheep stretching out in the grass and enjoying the peaceful surroundings. And by the way, some of you who are, might be going to Israel this year or you've been to Israel, you're not going to find a whole lot of places where there's a lot of green pastures and still waters anywhere in, in Israel. It's dirty, dusty, uh, brown. It's a lot like Southern California uh, <laughs> when, you, when you think about it. Uh, it, it it's, there, this is an unusual picture here. You're not going to cruise through Israel and see this picture everywhere. It, it's an unusual picture, but it, it's, it's a picture of the satisfaction that the sheep find in the, in the shepherd. And, and he makes and he leads, and those two should be taken to mean basically the same thing. He, he is leading me. Uh, that's his work. That's what his work is. He's leading me into peaceful satisfaction in my soul. And shepherds, different shepherds lead in different ways. Different parts of the world, shepherds go about it differently. Some shepherds... Uh, like they herd their sheep from the rear. But if you're in Israel and you are fortunate enough to see actually a, really, a real shepherd and his sheep, he's out in front. He's leading from the front. And, and that's the idea. He's leading me from the front where I should go. And that's what Jesus says, going back to John chapter 10, in terms of how he operates as a shepherd He's the, he's the true shepherd, and in chapter 10, verse 3, it says, To him the gatekeeper opens, the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. So the, 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 the shepherds would bring their sheep in at night. They'd all be in this common sheepfold, and in the morning they go to get their sheep, 
And, and here's one thing that, that shepherds do have is they do have a good voice recognition system. And they will, they will hear their shepherd and they will follow him and him only. Uh, they're, they're not listening to the other shepherd. They're just listening to their shepherd. And notice the shepherd calls them by name. Donner, Blitzen, <laughs> Rudolph. You know, come on, let's go. And, uh, and away they go. Uh, but here's what it is. And when, verse 4, and when he has brought out all his own, he goes before them. And the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. So they hear him, they hear his voice, they respond to his voice, and they follow him, and he leads them. That's the idea there. He, he leads them. He, he's the shepherd that he, that he calls and they respond. Verse 16 says, I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. They will listen to my voice. Verse 27, he says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Yeah, he calls sheep follow and he leads them into green pastures and next to still waters. Your, your satisfaction in the shepherd, so we could say it like this, will depend on you listening and following. And those who follow are, are going to find the satisfaction in their souls that he promises to them. Yes, sir. I think there it's Gentiles. He, he's in a Jewish context, and I think the best way to understand that is, is Gentiles. And, and, and Jesus talks about the kind of peace that he gives. And, and this is the kind of peace you want. In John 14, 27, he says, Peace I'll leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. See, the only kind of peace that the world has to offer is, is a kind of a phony peace when everything is going okay. You know, we base it on our circumstances. And if my circumstances all line up with how I want them, I'm, I can feel peaceful. Uh, Jesus says, I don't, I don't give that kind of peace. My peace isn't dependent on anything like that. I, I just give it to you. I just give it to you. And, and in um, John 16, verse 33, he says, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome the world. So, yeah, Jesus recognizes that in the world, things are not going to be peaceful. But you can have peace in your heart. You can have that inner contentment. And, and think about who's writing the psalm. David, did he have an outwardly peaceful life? No. I mean, might have been most peaceful when he was a shepherd. But I mean, if you really think about what it is to be a shepherd, it's not. It's, I mean, we've glamorized it, but you wouldn't want to be a shepherd. That's why he was the shepherd, because he's the youngest brother. Nobody else wants to do this. Let's get David to do it. And it's, it's nothing. But then, you know, he kills Goliath. That makes Saul envious of him. So then Saul's trying to kill him. And then he eventually becomes king, and he has a son, Absalom, who wants to kill him. And plus, he's got enemies on all sides who would love to kill him. And so David did not have a peaceful, quiet life. Um, but the Lord gives peace. And sheep are, like we said, they're defenseless, and they are naturally fearful, and we're just like them. So... If we were to take a survey here, and you all had to be honest, 
And we asked you, when was the last time you thought a fearful thought? <coughs> Wouldn't be too long ago. <laughs> If we were honest, probably wouldn't be too, too long ago. We, we get fearful about all kinds of things, and we do live in a dangerous, fearful world. There are things in this world to be fearful of. We're not saying be stupid. And, and we often worry. We, we often worry about a whole host of things. Um, but... What we're being told here is if we follow and listen to and trust the shepherd, our souls can feel like they're stretched out in a lush pasture. And that's what the shepherd wants for his sheep. He wants that. So it, we need to be sure we're listening to him and not all the other voices in the world. And, you know, just to give you an example, maybe this will help you think it through. There might be somebody here today who's worrying about something that's coming up a week from Thursday. I, I always pick on Thursday. So a week from Thursday, you've got something coming up, a, an appointment, a meeting, what, a test, whatever it is. You're, you're worried about something that's going to happen a week from Thursday. I'm here to tell you the shepherd owns a week from Thursday. And you don't need to be afraid. What the shepherd gives is way better than what the world gives. In Psalm 36, verses 7 to 9, it says, How precious is your steadfast love, O God! The children of mankind take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house, and you give them drink from the river of your delights. For with you is the fountain of life, and in your light do we see light. These are amazing statements that we can just breeze right by without stopping to think about. We need to learn to put aside worldly pursuits we need to learn to put to death fleshly desires and listen and follow the shepherd. Too often we don't listen or we aren't following <clears throat> or trust and, and we will fall, fall then into the spirit of the times. You know, the, Our times are perfectly characterized by a song that was incredibly popular when I was a kid. And the song is, I can't get no... A no, no, no. I can't get no satisfaction. I try and I try and I try and I try, but I can't get no. A no, no, no. That is the song of our culture. I can't get no satisfaction. Hey, follow the shepherd. Then you'll find satisfaction. The satisfaction that the world offers is a lie. The all-sufficient shepherd provides real satisfaction. Okay, does that sound good? Yeah, it does. And there's one other way that we see his sufficiency, and that's in verse 3 where it says, He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. So follow the shepherd to sanctification. That's what that verse is getting at. Like I said, sheep get dirty. Sheep get in trouble. Sheep stray. Did, that, did David ever do that? Do you ever do that? Yeah. Yeah, we do. But what we're told here, in fact... Uh, there's an amazing statement right at the end of Psalm 119, which is a great psalm on you know, the sufficiency of the Scriptures. Um, but in verse 176, the very last verse, this, uh, the, the writer of this psalm has extolled the greatness and the value and the power of God's Word all the way through. 
But he says in verse 176, I have gone astray like a lost sheep. Seek your servant, for I do not forget your commandments. And there, there's, a, there's an acknowledgement that you know, we're sheep and there's times when we, when we stray. We sing that song, prone to wander. Lord, I feel it. I felt it. Yes, ma'am. What what song are we talking about? What's his name? All right, it doesn't matter. It does it doesn't matter? But anyways, the, the the what we're told is that the shepherd restores. The shepherd restores. Sheep can get into a condition that's called being cast down. Uh, sometimes a sheep can get on its back and it can't get up. That that's another way. Uh, we, we see the condition of sheep. Uh, they, they get, and, and there's different ways that they can get into that position of being stuck on their back without being able to get up. They, they roll over into a nice, comfortable spot. And see, that's something. We can get too comfortable in this world. And we're not listening as much to the shepherd. That, that's, that's, a, that's a potential danger. Sometimes they roll over and can't get up because they got too much wool. And uh, we can accumulate too much of the world. And we're not listening to the shepherd anymore. Um, and you know what the shepherd does in that case is he cuts the wool off. Which I understand the sheep doesn't exactly like that that process, but when it's done, they, they, they feel great, so much lighter, not carrying all that stuff. We, and we stray off sometimes, like sheep do, and we get ourselves in trouble. We're not listening, we're not following, we take a step in, the, in, in another direction. Well, the good news is that the shepherd can restore and to restore there means to revive after there's been disorder or decay. So he comes in and restores us. And, you know, when the, when the shepherd would bring the, the sheep in to the fold at night, he would always count them to make sure all of his sheep are there. And so he's standing there at the gate to the sheepfold, and he's counting them. And there's, you know, number 97, 98, 99, 99. Where, where, where's, where's number 100? Where is that guy? And he doesn't say, well, you know, 99 out of 100, that's close enough for government work. Uh, you know, we'll just go with the 99. No, what does he do? He, he goes out and finds that one because that's, you know, sheep, they can, they might stray off. The shepherd goes and finds them. He res goes to restore them. And that's, that's exactly the picture that Jesus gives in Matthew 18, 12 to 14 about counting and there's only 99 and he goes and finds number 100. And, you know, if that becomes a pattern, if he has to keep chasing after this one sheep, uh, he will take extreme measures to restore that sheep. And David describes that in Psalm 51. Psalm 51 is his psalm of confession and repentance after his sin with Bathsheba. And uh, he says in verse 8, Psalm 51, 8, he says, Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Well, what's that all about? Well, that's what a shepherd would do. If you got a sheep that just keeps wandering off, eventually he breaks one of the legs. So, so for a while, you're not wandering off anywhere. And usually what he would do is he would carry that shepherd until the leg healed. He would carry that sheep. The shepherd would carry the sheep until the leg healed. And uh, and what the, the sheep learns during that time is, hey, this shepherd really loves me, and, and it's good to be close to him. I'm sticking close to him. And that's the shepherd's goal, is to restore 
that sheep. And, you know, the Bible tells us, like in Hebrews 12, that the Lord will discipline us. And, and, it, and one of the great understatements in, in all the Bible, it says no discipline at the time is enjoyable. Really. No, it's not enjoyable. It's like getting your leg broken. But in the end, it's good. It's good for you. The sheep learns to stay close to the shepherd. And, uh, you know, he restores primarily through his word. And his word can come to us any, any way. It, you know, we could be reading it on our own. We could hear a sermon. A friend could come to us. And, and as it says in Psalm 19.7, the, the, the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving or restoring the soul. You know, it's, it's the sheep who stay the closest to the shepherd are the ones who receive the most from him. So you've got to ask yourself, am I hanging out with the shepherd or am I at the far end of the pasture? Where I can still say, yeah, I'm one of his sheep and I'm hanging around, but are you close to him? And not only does he restore, verse 3 tells us that he leads us in the paths of righteousness. He leads us a day at a time, a step at a time. It's a walk. And he leads us in the right paths. Uh, another way you can understand that is in the well-worn ruts. He, he leads us down the track, the same track that he's been leading his people down throughout all the centuries. Same track that he was lead David down is the track he wants to lead you and me down. And, and we, we just, we just uh, uh, studied a verse last week about how the Spirit leads us, didn't we? Romans 8, 14, he's leading us. And again, his word is what he uses primarily to lead us. Uh, Psalm 119, verse 105 uh, says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. That's how he's leading us. And, that, and that's what 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All Scripture is inspired by God and is profitable, or you could translate that sufficient, it's sufficient for instruction to show me the way to go. It's, it's sufficient for reproof to show me when I've gotten off the way I should go. It's sufficient for correction to get me back on the way I should go. And it's sufficient for training in righteousness so I'll stay on the path. That's what the shepherd is doing. And, and sanctification uh, is, is a big deal. God is committed to your sanctification. He's going to lead you into your into he's committed to your holiness. And and a, a, just a quick way to define that would be becoming more like the shepherd, right? You got to believe that becoming more like Jesus is the very best thing that could happen to you. Spurgeon said, some Christians overlook the blessing of sanctification, yet to a renewed heart, this is one of his sweetest gifts. Uh, there's nothing better for us than to become more like our Lord. And then, you know, verse 3 ends with this. He, he does this restoring and he does this leading for his name's sake. For his name's sake. Now that guarantees that he will do it, and, and, and the result is that he'll get the glory. He does it for his name's sake. He's not doing it for your name's sake. He's doing it for his name's sake, which tells you he's committed to this whole process. He has taken on himself the name of the great shepherd, and he is going to do what the shepherd must do, He's going to do his part no matter how ornery the sheep get. That's good news. That 
because I've known some ornery sheep. I look at one every morning in the mirror. And, and I love this at, at Hebrews 13, 20 and 21. It says, Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. What was that That's Hebrews 13, verses 20 and 21. And so the great shepherd, this is what he does. This is what he does. It's, it's guaranteed. So the Lord is my shepherd. Everybody has a shepherd. It's just a matter of who it is. Everybody's got a shepherd. We want to be able to say the Lord is my shepherd. And if I can say the Lord is my shepherd, then I can also say I shall not want. I shall not want. And he's going to bring satisfaction and sanctification into my life. You know, I heard a story about an old pastor, and that's not me, but about an old pastor who got invited to some kind of a fancy banquet which, you know, he wasn't accustomed to going to things like this, but he got invited, so he went. And there was a famous actor there. And um, he was speaking at this banquet, and the actor was taking requests from the audience. You know, is there a line you'd like me to say from a movie or a play or, you know, uh, something you'd like to, to hear me recite? And so he was doing that, and the people were awestruck by his eloquence and the power of his voice and all that he could do. And so uh, he kept taking requests, and finally this old pastor, who's thinking, well, I don't get opportunities like this very often, he, he you know, raises his hand and says, could you recite Psalm 23? And the actor I guess the actor could feel a setup when he when one was coming. He says, "I'll tell you what. I will do it. I will do Psalm 23. Is it only if after I say it, you say it? Okay. Well, you know the pastor wasn't expecting that, but he says, "Oh, okay." So the actor does Psalm 23. You know, beautifully, eloquently, powerfully, and you know, he gets a standing ovation at, at the end. And now it's the pastor's turn. And he stands up and, you know, he's an old guy. His voice isn't as powerful as it used to be. And, but he gets up and he recites Psalm 23. When he's done, there's not a dry eye in the room. And the actor said, I understand the difference in your response. I know the psalm. He knows the shepherd. We want to be the people who know the shepherd. Amen? And that's just an idea if you're ever at a banquet and they're taking requests. <laughs> and now you, you've got an idea of what you, what you could call for. Okay, are there any questions, comments, criticisms? Yes, ma'am. What? Pastor is shepherd. Pastor, pastor is, uh, it, yeah, and that's, that's basically, that's, and that kind of helps understand part of what the pastor does, is he, he shepherds people, he cares for people, he leads them. Yeah. Yes, sir. I just find it interest, interesting that uh, when people get married, they learn the First um, Corinthians chapter 13, so you hear that all the time. When people are dying, they hear Psalm 23, you should quote it at a, a funeral. Yep. And then you have, uh, it's just different ones that are very popular. Right. That's why, yeah, so Psalm 23, you hear it a lot of different places. Um, and, and so, yeah, even unbelievers 
are familiar with Psalm 23. And then the Lord's Prayer is another one that people all know it. You're right. People really by, by memorizing them or hearing them over and over, but they, they don't have the... Like, yes, the, they're, they're familiar. The yeah, they're familiar with Psalm 23 or the Lord's Prayer or 1 Corinthians 13. You know, it's always interesting to me, you know, you get a coffee mug with 1 Corinthians 13 on it. 1 Corinthians 13 was a rebuke to a group of unloving sheep who were experiencing big time friction in their flock. It's not the, you know, it's not the love song that we've turned it into. And, and Psalm 23, yeah, usually you'll hear uh, verse 4 recited at a, at a funeral, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Nobody's dead in that verse. It, it, it's you're walking through a valley you're not dead and you're not dead because the shepherd is with you that's just that's for next week <laughs> uh, well, well, yes yeah yeah well he leads us down all the right paths the paths of righteousness and so, yeah, it's not, there's one back here, come on. Reverend? Why, why do people use the, the, the title reverend? You could call me that, holy reverend, holy, <laughs> or sometimes they're the right reverend. I prefer the always right reverend. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it, it's, it, it's not so common anymore. It used to be a common, just a title. And it, and it really, it reflected the fact that people used to have a lot more respect for pastors. I mean, if you're going to break it down, reverend is one to be reverenced or one to be respected that's what it's getting at. Um, but yeah, I don't sign my letters, Reverend Bruce Blakey. I don't, I don't do that, but, but that's where that comes from. And it, and it was a reflection of a time when people had a lot more respect for their pastor. Now, you know, that, that reflects uh, an attitude in the church that's different than it used to be but it's also because so many reverends have discredited the office. People have a hard time giving that kind of respect, e even though we should. We should show respect. The Bible commands us to do that. Um, but yeah, that's just what that title's getting at. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Right. As I listen to them, I don't always hear Yeah. Yeah. There are, I mean, obviously there are times that you set aside to pray, and then there's other times when you just pray. Right? And, the, and that sh should be like a normal, uh, for a Christian. We have times we set aside to pray, that we want to spend time with the Lord, and then we just pray as things come up during the day, right? That's the pray without ceasing kind of idea. I'm all, Prayer is always my first response. But, you know, I think it is important. Jesus did say, uh, here's the pattern. Pray like this. He's not saying to just repeat it. 
he, he's given you a pattern. And he was pretty committed to that pattern because he says it in Matthew 6 in one place, and then in Luke 11 in a different set of circumstances, he says the same thing. So, and in response to the disciples asking him, teach us how to pray, because they just watched him pray. So this was like Jesus' go-to message on prayer. And I think that that would be what you would want to think about in your times of prayer. He, he gives us a pattern. And by the way, in that prayer, there is a crying out for help. That, that's included in that. Uh, because there's a recognition that I, I, I need him. My, my daily sustenance is dependent upon him. Um, me staying free from temptation is dependent upon him. And so, yeah, there is all of that. And so I, I do think it's another uh, passage we become very familiar with and we don't do anything with it. Unless you go to a Catholic mass and they all know when to stand up and say it word for word. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? Psalm 23, it's a pretty good psalm, huh? Yeah. yeah, there's a lot here. And we got a lot more to look at uh, next time. We should sing that song. You always, it's always sung at high school retreats. You know, uh, love, joy, and... And then surely, the, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Have you guys ever sung that at a high school camp? Have you guys, are you guys Christians? <laughs> I think I've sung that at every high school retreat. Ben Blakey, the guy who wrote this song, he loved, he loved leading that song at high school retreats. Sing it for us. Next week. <laughs> Next week we're going to sing that song. What's the title of the song? What, what is it? Surely Goodness and Mercy? But you gotta, we all have to yell on the love, joy, and joy oh love peace and joy yeah so i got a week to learn it <laughs> and uh we'll be all right all i know is you're supposed to yell at a certain time so uh, I, I i just wait for that part all right yes ma'am Wow. All right. Free, free advertisement there. <laughs> Recommendation. Okay, well, there's no overflow out there today, so we can go ahead and pray, and uh, we can wrap up the room here, get it ready for high school, and then be first in line for donuts and coffee. Let's, <laughs> let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this great psalm. We thank you, Lord, for the truth that's contained in it about the shepherd. It's all about what the shepherd does. Uh, he, he's the one that makes me lie down. He's the one who leads me. He's the one who restores me. It's all about what he is doing. And Lord, obviously, uh, the, the call to all of us is to listen to him and follow him. That that's the way to experience a peaceful, satisfied heart. That's the way to grow in sanctification. Uh, Lord, we're so thankful that we have such a loving shepherd who demonstrated that love in the ultimate way in lying down his life for us uh, so that we could become his sheep in the first place. Uh, Lord, I, I pray that as a result of all of this time, our love for the shepherd would grow tremendously. And so we thank you for this time. We thank you for your goodness to us. And we thank you in our shepherd's name. Amen. <laughs>